Welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Thomas Burr. I'm the Washington correspondent for the Salt Lake Tribune and the 109th president of the National Press Club. Our guest today is billionaire businessman and tech pioneer Peter Till. I would like to welcome our public radio and C-SPAN audiences. And I want to remind you that you can follow the action live on Twitter using the hashtag NPCLive. That's NPCLive. Today's format follows the same tradition of National Press Club luncheons with some remarks by our guest and then a question and answer session concluding in an hour. I will ask as many questions submitted from journalists online and from the reporters in the audience. Peter Till is a man who wears many hats. He helped found PayPal and Palantir Technologies. He's a venture capitalist, he successfully sued Gawker, and he's a rare vocal supporter of Donald Trump in Silicon Valley. That's what he's here to talk about today. Till, a billionaire, has used his money recently to invest in electing Trump as America's next president. Before garnering headlines for that, he used his reserves to fund Facebook, LinkedIn, Yelp, and other companies associated with the so-called PayPal Mafia, and his own Till Foundation and Till Fellowship. Till plans to donate $1.25 million toward the efforts to elect Trump, have raised eyebrows in liberal-leaning Silicon Valley. The New York Times called him toxic among technology investors and entrepreneurs. But Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg, a Democratic donor, defended Till's choice, saying it would set a bad precedent to cut ties with him because of his political views. Till laid out his support for the Republican presidential candidate in a primetime speech at the Republican National Convention in July. He didn't donate to the campaign until earlier this month, announcing the contribution shortly, shortly after revelations of uh, recorded comments about Trump uh, made about women. He said he'd like to contribute through a combination of direct giving to the campaign and the super PACs, including $1 million donation to the super PAC Make America Number One. In media circles, Teal is best known for funding wrestler Hulk Hogan's successful lawsuit against Gawker. This irreverent news website ended up closing its doors in August after filing for bankruptcy because of the ruling in the case. Till had long feuded with the site, which has outed him as gay nearly a decade earlier. Till is a Stanford alum who bills himself as a contrarian and has backed libertarian politician Ron Paul. He's also the author of books such as The Diversity Myth, Multiculturalism and Political Intolerance on Campus, and Zero to One, Notes on Startups and How to Build the Future. Please help me welcome to the National Press Club to talk about his political choices and motivations, Mr. Peter Thiel. Thank you very much for having me here. Everybody knows we've been living through a crazy election year. Real events seem like the rehearsals for Saturday Night Live. Only an outbreak of insanity would seem to account for the unprecedented fact that this year, a political outsider managed to win a major party nomination. To the people who are used to influencing our choice of leaders, to the wealthy people who give money and the commentators who give reasons why, it all seems like a bad dream. Donors don't want to find out how and why we got here. They just want to move on. Come November 9th, they hope everyone else will go back to business as usual. But it is just this heedlessness, this temptation to ignore difficult realities indulged in by our most influential citizens that got us where we are today. A lot of successful people are too proud to admit it since it seems to put their success in question. But the truth is, no matter how crazy this election seems, it is less crazy than the condition of our country. Just look at the generation that supplies most of our leaders. The baby boomers are entering retirement in a state of actuarial bankruptcy. 64% of those over the age of 55 have less than a year's worth of savings to their name. That is a problem, especially when this is the only country where you have to pay up to 10 times as much for simple medicines as you would pay anywhere else. America's overpriced healthcare system might help subsidize the rest of the world, but that doesn't help the Americans who can't afford it, and they've started to notice. Our youngest citizens may not have huge medical bills, but their college tuition keeps on increasing faster than the rate of inflation, adding more every year to our $1.3 trillion mountain of student debt. America has become the only country where students take on loans they can never escape, not even by declaring bankruptcy. Stuck in this broken system, 
Millennials are the first generation who expect their own lives to be worse than the lives of their parents. While American families' expenses have been increasing relentlessly, their incomes have been stagnant. In real dollars, the median household makes less money today than it made 17 years ago. Nearly half of Americans wouldn't be able to come up with $400 if they needed it for an emergency. Yet while households struggle to keep up with the challenges of everyday life, the government is wasting trillions of dollars of taxpayer money on faraway wars. Right now, we're fighting five of them in Iraq, Syria, Libya, Yemen, and Somalia. Now, not everyone is hurting. In the wealthy suburbs that ring Washington, D.C., people are doing just fine. Where I work in Silicon Valley, people are doing just great. But most Americans don't live by the Beltway or the San Francisco Bay. Most Americans haven't been part of that prosperity. It shouldn't be surprising to see people vote for Bernie Sanders or for Donald Trump, who is the only outsider left in the race. Very few people who vote for president have ever thought of doing something so extreme as running for president. The people who run are often polarizing. This election year, both major candidates are imperfect people, to say the least. Now, I don't agree with everything Donald Trump has said and done, and I don't think the millions of other people voting for him do either. Nobody thinks his comments about women were acceptable. I agree they were clearly offensive and inappropriate. But I don't think the voters pull the lever in order to endorse a candidate's flaws. It's not a lack of judgment that leads Americans to vote for Trump. We're voting for Trump because we judge the leadership of our country to have failed. This judgment has been hard to accept for some of the country's most fortunate, socially prominent people. It's certainly been hard to accept for Silicon Valley, where many people have learned to keep quiet if they dissent from the coastal bubble. Louder voices have sent a message that they do not intend to tolerate the views of one half of the country. This intolerance has taken on some bizarre forms. The Advocate, a magazine which once praised me as a gay innovator, even published an article saying that as of now I am, and I quote, not a gay man, unquote, because I don't agree with their politics. The lie behind the buzzword of diversity could not be made more clear. If you don't conform, then you don't count as diverse, no matter what your personal background. Faced with such contempt, why do voters still support Donald Trump? Even if they think the American situation is serious, why would they think that Trump, of all people, could make it any better? I think it's because of the big things that Trump gets right. For example, free trade has not worked out well for all of America. It helps, that Trump, um, it helps Trump that the other side just doesn't get it. All of our elites preach free trade. The highly educated people who make public policy explain that cheap imports make everyone a winner, according to economic theory. But in actual practice, we've lost tens of thousands of factories and millions of jobs to foreign trade. The heartland has been devastated. Maybe policymakers really believe that nobody loses, or maybe they don't worry about it too much because they think they're among the winners. The sheer size of the US trade deficit shows that something has gone badly wrong. The most developed country in the world should be exporting capital to less developed countries. Instead, the United States is importing more than $500 billion every year. That money flows into financial assets. It distorts our economy in favor of more banking and more financialization, and it gives the well-connected people who benefit a reason to defend the status quo. But not everyone benefits, and the Trump voters know it. 
I think Trump voters are also tired of war. We have been at war for 15 years, and we have spent more than $4.6 trillion. More than 2 million people have lost their lives, and more than 5,000 American soldiers have been killed. But we haven't won. The Bush administration promised that $50 billion could bring democracy to Iraq. Instead, we've squandered 40 times as much to bring about chaos. Yet even after these bipartisan failures, the Democratic Party is more hawkish today than at any time since it began the war in Vietnam. Harking back to the no-fly zone that Bill Clinton enforced uh, over Iraq before Bush's failed war, now Hillary Clinton has called for a no-fly zone over Syria. Incredibly, that would be a mistake even more reckless than invading Iraq. Since most of the planes flying over Syria today are Russian planes, Clinton's proposed course of action would do worse than involve us in a messy civil war. It would risk a direct nuclear conflict. What explains this eagerness to escalate a dangerous situation? How can Hillary Clinton be so wildly over-optimistic about the outcome of war? I would suggest that it comes from a lot of practice. For a long time, our elites have been in the habit of denying difficult realities. That's how bubbles form. Whenever there is a hard problem, but people want to believe in an easy solution, they will be tempted to deny reality and inflate a bubble. Something about the experience of the baby boomers, whose lives have been so much easier than their parents or their children's, has led them to buy into bubbles again and again. The trade bubble says everyone's a winner. The war bubble says victory is just around the corner. But these over-optimistic stories simply haven't been true, and voters are tired of being lied to. It was both insane and somehow inevitable that DC insiders expected this election to be a rerun between the two political dynasties who led us through the two most gigantic financial bubbles of our time. President George W. Bush presided over the inflation of a housing bubble so big that its collapse is still causing economic stagnation today. But what's strangely forgotten is that last decade's housing bubble was just an attempt to make up for the gains that had been lost in the decade before that. In the 1990s, President Bill Clinton presided over an enormous stock market bubble and a devastating crash in 2000, just as his second term was coming to an end. That's how long the same people have been pursuing the same disastrous policies. Now that someone different is in the running, someone who rejects the false reassuring stories that tell us everything is fine, his larger than life persona attracts a lot of attention. Nobody would suggest that Donald Trump is a humble man. But the big things he's right about amount to a much needed dose of humility in our politics. Very unusually for a presidential candidate, he has questioned the core concept of American exceptionalism. He doesn't think the force of optimism alone can change reality without hard work. Just as much as it's about making America great, Trump's agenda is about making America a normal country. A normal country doesn't have a half trillion dollar trade deficit. A normal country doesn't fight five simultaneous undeclared wars. In a normal country, the government actually does its job. And today it's important to recognize that the government has a job to do. Voters are tired of hearing conservative politicians say that government never works. They know the government wasn't always this broken. The Manhattan Project, the interstate highway system, the Apollo program, whatever you think of these ventures, you cannot doubt the competence of the government that got them done. But we have fallen very far from that standard. We cannot let free market ideology serve as an excuse
for decline. No matter what happens in this election, what Trump represents isn't crazy and it's not going away. He points toward a new Republican Party beyond the dogmas of Reaganism. He points even beyond the remaking of one party to a new American politics that overcomes denial, rejects bubble thinking, and reckons with reality. When the distracting spectacles of this election season are forgotten and the history of our time is written, the only important question will be whether or not that new politics came too late. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thiel. Appreciate you being here at the National Press Club. Uh, let's start off with a few, uh, as a part of our conversation. I think I want to get to a lot of topics. We have a few hundred questions, I think, already All submitted right, from exactly. people. Uh, but let's talk about the, the campaign here. Uh, your candidate uh, has uh, talked a lot about how, what's wrong with America. Uh, there are a lot of uh, dissatisfied uh, voters out there right now. Uh, do you see this election as uh, anything more than a contest to see who will be, who will be the next captain of the Titanic? Well, I hope, I hope not. Um, I, uh, I have always had a bias in favoring outsider candidates. Uh, you know, I, I've supported Ron Paul in 08 uh, and 2012. Uh, I supported Carly Fiorina early in this race. So I, I have a strong bias for outsiders. I think um, the insiders are often you know, much more polished. Uh, they're ex talented politicians. But a lot of what they do does feel, to me, like rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. So it's precisely because I'm worried about that that I think uh, we, uh, we need to think a little bit outside the conventional policy box and we need to have a sort of a broader public debate about the kinds of things we, we might want to do. But, but certainly uh, I worry about the decline. I take it very seriously. And, uh, and uh, one of the things, you know, I think I, I would have liked to see a race between Trump and Sanders because I think both of them viscerally felt the decline and viscerally um, we, they very much disagreed about what caused it, what to do about it, but that would have been a very different sort of debate. What we have is a debate between you know, one candidate who says everything's more or less fine or it's as good as it can be, and then uh, another one who says uh, you know, that we're on the Titanic, it's about to sink. And so I, I prefer the second one. So you, you talk a lot about backing an outsider and how that's important for America, but isn't there also something to be said about somebody who understands how Washington works better to actually get things done? Uh, there, you know, um, that's, well, we've been trying that for, you know, I would argue we've been trying that for quite a long time. The, um, on, on, the kinds of, um, on the kinds of issues I, I talked about uh, today, um, you know, the trade bubble, the, uh, the war bubble, the globalization bubble, these various bubble policies, the insiders have been getting it wrong for, for a long time. Uh, you know, they were asleep at the switch when we had the dot-com bubble in the 90s. They were even more asleep, I would argue, when we have had the housing bubble in the last decade. And uh, the insiders have uh, somehow uh, been doing uh, very micro policy adjustments and then letting these massive bubbles uh, inflate on their watch. Um, and so I, I think there is, uh, there is an argument. Uh, I, I, the, the Trump uh, point that he's made repeatedly that you know, Hillary has experienced, but it's bad experience, somehow resonates with me a lot. Has your support of Mr. Trump affected any relationships or close business relationships in Silicon Valley? Uh, you know, it's, it certainly has generated a tremendous amount of uh, discussion, gotten a lot of pushback from people, to say the least. But, uh, but you know, I think my uh, fr uh, friendships, close working business relationships, I think all those are, you know, are very well intact. Do you have any other Silicon Valley uh, businessmen you deal with who are more privately supporting Mr. Trump but don't want to say it's publicly? You know, it's uh, it's one of the one of the strange things of, of this uh, of doing this has it has surfaced, uh, you know, not a large number, but a, a small number of those people who, uh, you know, of course, all feel like they can't say it in public and, and whatnot, and uh, and are you know happy that I've I've done it. So it's it's it, they've sort of been conjured out of the ether. Yes. Well, let me talk about that for a second. What have you learned this election cycle about Silicon Valley's uh, appetite for political difference? Well, I uh, it's. It's more polarized than I realized. You know, I, I certainly, uh, you know, I thought of Silicon Valley as a, you know, fairly liberal, fairly democratic uh, place. It, you know, overwhelmingly backed Obama in 2008, um, 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 and um, 
but uh, but I didn't think uh, I didn't think it was going to be uh, this uh, that there would be this sort of a visceral reaction where um, you know and again mo you know most of the uh, the larger uh, tech companies uh, you know uh, most of the you know many of these people have not said that you know you shouldn't be able to back Trump or anything like this but it's surprising me that anybody would say that um, that you're beyond the pale for taking a position that's held by half the country you know there there are, there are positions that are beyond the pale there. Are, you know, extreme fringe views. I've often supported, you know, fringe views in life extension or fringe views in seasteading, which are very minority views. This is the first time I've done something that's actually conventional. It didn't feel contrarian. This was the first, it was like, it's the first time I've done something big in my life that was just what half the country believed in. And it's been the most controversial thing ever. So that's, that really surprised me. Well, have you suffered any, uh, has your, have your company suffered any blowback because of your position? Um, I don't, you know, I don't think so. But I think, I think that would be that would be an even crazier thing. You know, it's like, uh, to conf you know, I'm not Trump. Um, my, you know, um, the, the 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 founders, the companies I invest in are not me. Their employees are not the founders. And if you sort of conflate two or three or four groups of people like this, that's a really crazy thing to do. It's, uh, you know, perhaps we should occasionally be held um, response partially responsible for people who are one degree of separation from us. Um, if you hold people responsible for people who are two degrees or three degrees of separation, that way lies insanity. But just to clarify, you don't believe your companies have faced any blowback from consumers or other vendors you deal with because of your position? Uh, not in any meaningful way, no. In your RNC, in the RNC convention speech, you said, where I work in Silicon Valley, it's hard to see where America has gone wrong. Do you think Silicon Valley understands America? And, and what's that source of disconnect there? Um, it's, it, uh, Silicon Valley has been extremely successful over uh, the last, uh, last decade or so. Uh, it is, uh, it's, um, but it's been a success that um, is a success of specific companies, um, you know, a number of which I've been involved in. Um, and the story people in Silicon Valley always want to tell is one in which their specific success as individuals and as companies uh, gets conflated with a story of general success and general progress in the United States. So we're doing well, therefore, our whole civilization is doing well, everybody is doing well, the whole country is taken to the next level. And so that's the, that's the narrative people love to tell, specific success linked to general success. And I think the, the truth has been more uh, one of specific success, but more general failure. You know, I've, been a, I've been a critic of Twitter, for example, where on my, uh, on our website, we've said, you know, they promised us flying cars and all we got was 140 characters. Um, but, uh, but, you know, that it's, it's not a critique, critique of Twitter as a company. It's a perfectly good company. The, you know, people who work there have well-paying jobs. Um, it's a perfectly great company. It's just not enough to um, improve living standards for 300 million plus Americans. Well, while we're on the topic, I want to get back to Trump for a second. but. How do you think that, that disconnect in some ways uh, shapes the companies and the products that are created there? It's, um, you know, that's, this, gets very, this gets very speculative, but I would say that uh, I would, one, one way of, I've often described the dichotomy is that Silicon Valley deals in the world of bits. Most of the economy is the world of atoms. So the world of bits is computers, internet, mobile internet, software, that ensemble. And there's been a narrow cone of progress around of those kinds of industries, but then uh, you often have less good of an understanding for um, the uh, the sort of industries that involve in atoms that involve in building things. Uh, so you know, real estate, which Trump is in, is sort of the, maybe the stereotypical industry involving atoms. Those are ones that are often much more he heavily regulated than the world of bits. And so, if you're in the world of atoms, you might be very concerned about government regulation. If you're in the world of bits, which is much less regulated, uh, you might be much less concerned about government regulation. So there is this, this, this big separation just in terms of what they do. I wouldn't blame that on just a blind spot Silicon Valley has. I think that's a little bit too easy. Perhaps Silicon Valley has focused on the world of bits because um, it's actually gotten very hard to do things in the world of atoms. You know, when I was an undergraduate at Stanford, um, you know, there were still a lot of different engineering fields you could study in the 1980s. They were all bad decisions. It was a bad idea to become an aeroastro engineer. It was a bad idea to become a chemical engineer or mechanical engineer. These were all uh, industries that were sort of in structural decline because they were getting outlawed. They were getting regulated to death. Nuclear engineering, I mean, your parents would have, you know, 
would have been irresponsible to let you study that as a field in the 1980s. Um, the only, you know, even electrical engineering, which was semiconductors, and that's sort of on the boundary between atoms and bits, that was a good field for about a decade, not so much anymore. Um, computer science, not even an engineering field, that was the only sort of scientific technical field that actually had a future in the 1980s. Let's go back to Mr. Trouble. We'll have uh, more questions about Silicon Valley in a minute. But was the timing of your donation uh, in any way related, the donation to the Trump campaign, in any way related to the revelation of the, the Access Hollywood tape about Mr. Trump? Uh, no. I mean, I, I, I think the, the tape was, I think the tape was, uh, was, was an extremely, extremely poor taste, extremely inappropriate, as I, as I, as I said. Uh, I, uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't think as much even about the donation as I should have. My, my, my general perspective on this, uh, on this year was that money actually didn't matter that much. It, uh, it, uh, the, the candidates who raised the most money on the presidential level um, did incredibly badly. Um, I didn't even think that Trump needed my money. Uh, um, you know, he hadn't raised that much money. They hadn't asked me for money. I hadn't donated. And so when they asked me, you know, I wasn't sure they needed it, but I, I thought I'd go ahead and write them a check. But, uh, but I, didn't, uh, I didn't think that much of this connection. And, and of course, um, I didn't think anybody would think that you would donate to a candidate because of the worst thing they've done. You know, you, you support candidates normally because of the things you like about them, not the things you, you dislike. And I, it, it's odd. And I think, like, I think this is, I think almost all the people who are voting for Trump are voting uh, bec because of um, the sense that the U.S. is very badly off track and that perhaps we have to uh, do some things to fix it. You mentioned in your speech that Mr. Trump is not necessarily humble. Uh, but are you concerned about some of the personality traits, the, the comments about women, uh, his more bombastic style? Uh, are you concerned uh, uh, what that says to younger Americans and says to our pol political discourse today? Well, I think, we're, you know, I think we've been pretty clear this year that there are, there are a lot of things that are beyond the pale. And I think there are, there are things that Trump um, uh, said you know, a decade ago that even he would uh, absolutely no longer no longer say today. So I think I, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I think that our, that, I think that part of our discourse is, you know, getting policed adequately and, and will continue to be, be policed adequately. I think that, uh, I think the temperament, you know, the, the kind, the kind of uh, place where, where I, I worry about that most on a policy level is, do we get into more wars or not? And I'm not sure whether that's a, sort of a matter of temperament or more a matter of, of, uh, of worldview, but, uh, but certainly I would, worry much more on that with, with Hillary getting us into wars. You know, the nuclear one, which is the most dangerous, probably involves still a confrontation with Russia. And, uh, and I, don't think, you know, I don't think Hillary Clinton has accused Trump of um, being overly hostile to Putin. <laughs> but are you concerned about uh, Mr. Trump's temperament when it comes to the nuclear codes at all? Uh, well, I, don't think, I, I, think that, I think he wouldn't even get us into a situation where it would be even close with respect to Russia. So I think if you actually look at the specifics, where, where might something happen? Where might something go wrong? I would think, uh, I would think that in some ways Hillary's much more dangerous than Trump. I, I don't think Hillary will get us in a nuclear war either, but, uh, but it's a much more confrontational foreign policy. What about Mr. Trump's temperament with, uh, with other countries, North Korea, China, uh, that, that could pose some trouble if he were elected president because of how he responds? Well, North Korea you know, has been a problem for, for a long time. I think at this point, it's, um, it's actually more a problem for China than for the U.S. It's a, it's a pure client state of China. Um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't like the way China is managing it. I'd like them to do something to, to change things around rather than, than tolerate the, the horrible dictatorship that exists there. But I think, uh, I think China will keep it a, you know, a very bad, very unhappy, but a very low volatility situation. Let's go back to domestic politics. As an entrepreneur yourself, where do you place Donald Trump's economic plan against Hillary Clinton's plan? What key factors in this plan uh, do you think will nurture small business ascension uh, versus Secretary Clinton? Um, well, I think it is, uh, I think it, it's, for, first off, um, it is just this general way in which it is, it is uh, rejecting the sort of bubble thinking. And I think, I think uh, what we have to acknowledge is that the bubbles that we've had in this country since the 1990s have on net been catastrophic. You know, the tech bubble that I experienced firsthand in the late 90s in Silicon Valley was extremely exciting. It seemed to accelerate things tremendously, but then, um, 
Then, you know, after it crashed, uh, B2C meant back to consulting, B2B meant back to banking, and, uh, and I think the whole thing ended up leading to an enormous misallocation of capital, even worse, an enormous misallocation of talent. People went into new industries, they lost their jobs, their careers went sideways for many years, um, and, uh, and so I think, I think that uh, this sort of bubble history has been very catastrophic, and uh, that's sort of an honest assessment of, of our economy and what to do would start uh, with, with talking about that. Temperamentally, um, uh, I think that Trump understands, he viscerally understands uh, the, um, the ways in which government regulations are, you know, they're not that bad for big business because big business often has the resources to deal with them. Sometimes big business even likes regulation because it knocks out the small businesses that might compete. Um, but it's catastrophic for small businesses and uh, there's been, you know, there's been much less formation of small businesses in, um, in the last decade or so in the U.S. relative to historical, uh, the historical baseline. You can debate why this happens, why questions are always hard to answer, but, uh, but my, my instinct is that it does have something to do with, a, with uh, the, the toughness of the regulatory climate in this country. Mr. Trump builds himself as a, uh, builds himself as a big, uh, good businessman, uh, yet there's been a lot of stories recently about the bankruptcy he's had in his companies, uh, his the fact that he won't release his taxes to say how much he's actually uh, contributed to charities. Do you have those raise any concerns in your mind? Well, you know, I, I think he's been a successful businessman. I think he's been a very successful real estate developer. Uh, there's no question about that. You know, we can, we can debate, um, you know, how many zeros exactly he has uh, in his net worth, but he has, you know, he has a lot. So he has a huge number even. Um, I think that, uh, I think that uh, I'm, you know, real estate is, a, is an industry that's very different from tech, and so it's not one I would consider myself that expert at evaluating the specifics of what someone has done. I think it's a, it's a fairly zero-sum business. It's a very tough industry, especially in our big urban c cities like Manhattan or San Francisco, and, uh, and I suspect that, uh, that in many ways, you know, what Trump did was, was uh, par for the course in, uh, in, that, in that context. Uh, you know, we have an enormous amount of transparency on our political leaders. I think that's a good thing. Um, in, on the whole, there's, a, there's always a question whether there's a point where it gets pushed too far. Um, you know, I would, I would worry that we ask so much, um, we, have, you know, we examine people under an electron microscope if you're running for dog catcher in this country. And at some point, and I, would th I, I do think that uh, this is the single biggest reason that um, more talented people do not run for political office and do not get involved. It's, uh, it's you know, there's the, the transparency in some ways um, is off, often gets taken in this, in this very toxic direction. So I don't know whether or not Trump should, you know, release his tax returns, but I think, I think uh, uh, at this point the American people uh, know far more than enough to make up their minds about the two candidates. You do believe, though, that the vetting process for American political candidates should be strong and, and thorough, right? Oh, it should be, it should be very strong. And it is very strong, um, but I but I also believe that uh, that there there are a large number of uh, that we have we have in some ways have a less talented group of people running today versus 40 or 50 years ago. You know, I think the vetting process was very tough. You know, when Kennedy was running for president in 1960, but uh, it's not clear somebody like Kennedy would be electable uh, in today's world. Uh, has Mr. Trump given you any private assurances he wouldn't roll back progress on LGBT rights or those appointments to the Supreme Court wouldn't undo the rulings for same-sex marriage nationwide? You know, I've not had conversations with Mr. Trump on that, on that specific subject. I, I do think that uh, he represents a, a sea change from the Republican Party of, uh, of uh, Bush 43. You just think about the way Bush 43 was uh, speaking uh, negatively about gay marriage at every single campaign event in the 2004 election. Uh, it's something where, um, you know, Trump has, uh, you know, every, everything he's indicated is that he would be quite expansive on, uh, on gay rights. Uh, lastly, I'll move on to another topic, but do you personally support uh, Mr. Trump's uh, comments and rhetoric before about banning Muslims from traveling to the United States? You know, I, 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 I don't support a religious test. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't use, uh, you know, I certainly don't support, you know, the specific language Trump has used in every, every instance. But I think, uh, you know, I think one thing that should be made distinguished here is that, you know, the media always is taking Trump literally 
It never takes them seriously, but it always takes them literally. I think a lot of the voters who vote for Trump um, take Trump seriously, but not literally. And so when they hear things like the Muslim comment or the wall comment or things like that, it's not, uh, the question is not, you know, are you going to build a wall like the Great Wall of China or, you know, how, how exactly are you going to force these, these tests? What they hear is uh, we're going to have, we're going to have a saner, more sensible immigration policy. We're going to try to figure out um, a way to uh, figure out, you know, how do we, um, how do we strike the right balance between costs and benefits? And you know, immigration, um, it's, uh, it's not an all or nothing thing. It's not that you should let everybody in. It's not that you should let nobody in. Those are, those are two very different positions. They're ex um, exclusive, but they're not exhaustive. There's a lot of room in between. And the question, the policy question is how to, how to tackle that. And, uh, and I do think there's something, you know, we live in an, there's an immigration bubble where we say, you know, it's all good, you shouldn't ask questions. Um, and I think, I think we could have a better policy. I, I, would, I personally would like one like uh, Canada or Australia. I think those countries have um, much better policies than our country and we could um, you know, become a more normal country, learn from places that are doing it better than we are. Switching subjects, you're sitting here at the National Press Club surrounded by journalists. Do you believe you've set a dangerous precedent in secretly suing Gawker in connection with its publication of the Hulk Hogan video? Uh, and are you engaged in any other lawsuits? But let's start with that precedent. What, is that a dangerous precedent to set? Uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. You know, you know, you, you st let's start with uh, the, you know, the facts of the case. It involved a sex tape. You know, if, if, you, if you make a sex tape of someone with their permission, you are a pornographer. If you make a sex tape without their permission, we were told now, you are a journalist. I, I would submit that as an insult to all journalists. This is not about the First Amendment. It's, uh, it is about the most egregious violation of, um, of privacy imaginable, publishing a sex tape surreptitiously filmed in the privacy of someone's bedroom. Um, and, uh, and to hide behind the First Amendment, behind uh, 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 journalism, that is an insult. That is an insult to journalists. Th and that's, you know, that's, why, that's why Gawker lost so catastrophically at the, at the court in, in Tampa, Florida, because they were arguing all these sort of abstract, uh, abstract theories, and we kept focusing on the facts of the case. You know, there was a deposition of A.J. Delario, the editor who published the sex tape. In the deposition, um, uh, we asked him, so is there a sex tape you wouldn't publish? Um, well, maybe if it involved a child. Then we asked, you know, what age child? He said, well, if it was a four-year-old child. There were sort of gasps by the jury at that point. So like, you know, and maybe it was, you know, it, it, it sort of was like, he was like an aspiring child pornographer. And, um, and that's, that's not what journalism is about. So, uh, so I, 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 I strongly believe in the First Amendment. I believe, you know, I believe uh, journalists are a privileged group in our society. They play an important uh, role in, in um, getting us information in, in the, our system of checks and balances. Um, uh, but uh, but these, were not, these were not journalists. Well, do you think what happened to Gawker could happen to other news publications? I mean, d d could wealthy, powerful people uh, seek revenge against a news organization um, because of something they didn't like and use their influence and money to, to take them out? You know, um, they shouldn't, uh, wealthy people shouldn't do that. I, I think if they try, they won't succeed. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the, you know, Gawker was, it was a pretty flimsy business. It was, it was a bad business. It didn't make that much money. But uh, they could have withstood all the lawsuits. Um, you know, they lost because the, the, of an enormous verdict that came in against them. Uh, that's, wh that's, why they, that's why they lost at the end of the day. I could have underwritten, you know, many more lawsuits. Um, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't the problem. The problem was that they lost on the facts. Um, you know, I, uh, I thought that it, you know, I thought, you know, I was, I was very careful in the, in the Hulk Hogan litigation in uh, picking a lawsuit where the fight was over privacy. We did not even bring a libel action because that was sort of the, the way I wanted to make clear in, in the Hogan case that uh, that uh, it was it was not about the media, it was not about the media more generally. Are you engaged in any other lawsuits against news organizations? Uh, and, and not 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 uh, I've you know been involved in the, in the Gawker case, nothing else. And and part of you know part of my thought was again they were a singularly 
they were a singularly uh, um, uh, sociopathic uh, bully. Um, it was, uh, it, it, my, my view is that other journalists, other media organizations, were not remotely in the same ballpark. Um, can you tell us how you got involved, and especially how uh, and when you got connected to uh, Charles Hardner, Hulk Hogan's lawyer in the Gawker case, and why you did this, you know, secretly? Well, it, you know, it, it was it was a it been it was a multi-year, um, and I'd be a little bit careful what I comment on this since uh, since uh, the litigation is still ongoing. But uh, but I uh, got involved uh, over a number of years, uh, and it was one of these things where as you got involved, you you came to believe in the justice of the case more and more because there were so many different people um, uh, that uh, you interacted with who had been destroyed. You know, in many cases, in most cases, it was it was not. Um, it was not super prominent people. It was uh, it, or super wealthy people. It was people who couldn't afford to do anything, you know. And uh, and one of the striking things is that if you're you know if you're middle class, if you're upper middle class, if you're a single digit millionaire like Hulk Hogan, you have no effective access to our legal system. It costs too much. Um, and uh, this was the modus operandi of of uh, Gawker in large part. It was to go after people who had no chance of, of, of fighting back. You know, uh, we, we can debate about whether uh, the more appropriate thing for me would have been to be transparent about, about funding it uh, all the way through. But uh, my judgment was that, uh, that uh, Mr. Hogan deserved to have his day in court and that that would have distracted from, from his day in court. You know, he, um, that, that transparency in that would have turned it into, into this, uh, this very different narrative, into the Gawker narrative that it's the, Billionaire trying to um, to uh, to squash the First Amendment, rather than what what I think it, it was actually about, which was, you know, an egregious violation of privacy, the publication of a sex tape, and you know, as a um, you know, one other uh, perspective on this is that uh, you know, I've been involved with the internet for the last for the last twenty years. I'm generally in favor of the internet. I generally think it's been been a good thing, um, but I think that uh, there are some parts of it that where where things have gone wrong and. Uh, and one kind of phenomenon that's very new that can take place on the internet is this sort of uh, um, transparency and anonym anonymity combined. We have this sort of these mob flash mobs that get directed at uh, specific individuals. That's a very new phenomenon, uh, and Gawker in some ways perfected it, where uh, you you'd pick on people and you would destroy their lives, um, and you'd, you'd write nasty stories. The writers might then even add comments that were even more vicious than the ones in the story, all so as to generate a virtual mob that would go after, after these people. Um, there were many different targets they had. They had targets in you know, Silicon Valley. They had celebrities as targets. But one big class of targets that Gawker went after were people in the media. You know, the sort of one class of people they especially hated were other reporters, other writers. And, um, and you know, in the sort of prehistory, as I was as, as we're building up this case, you know, a few people I talked about it, and some of the people who encouraged me to keep going were some of my friends in the media, because they knew how much Gawker had had actually specifically targeted more successful writers and reporters over the years. You've had a feud with Gawker for more than a decade, as I said in my introduction. Uh, when did you decide that funding another person's lawsuit would be the best course of action to take down Gawker, and when did you set this in motion? Uh, you know, it's, it, it, it would have been uh, roughly coeval with the time the, the Harder firm started to work with Hogan, so over you know, four or five years ago. Uh, you know, my initial, my initial view was that uh, what you were supposed to do was you were supposed to take your beatings, um, crouch down, go into a fetal position, and then hope they moved on to somebody else. And, uh, and sort of around 20, 2011, one of my friends convinced me that, uh, that if, uh, if Gawker could get away with this sort of sociopathic repeat behavior over and over. It was this tragedy of the commons. Nobody, um, nobody would ever, um, you know, they would, they would continue to ruin lives one after another. Um, and there were many people that did things to far worse than me. And, uh, and so, you know, I was convinced that if I didn't do something, nobody would. The candidate you're supporting for president, Mr. Trump, uh, has spoken several times about uh, changing libel laws in this country so he can sue news outlets uh, essentially for stories that he doesn't like. We have laws in place right now to protect uh, public figures as well as ordinary citizens. Where do you draw the line? Well, uh, I, I don't think the libel laws 
I don't think the libel laws need to be uh, need to be changed. I, I, I think that uh, I think there certainly are questions about um, how we uh, you know are there some new facts and circumstances that are a little different. So I think I think it's always good to ask questions. You know, if you're the uh, if you're the child of a celebrity, do you um, get to subject to the same amount of scrutiny as celebrity? Even if you're a public figure, can your sex tape be made public? Don't think so. Um, if you're if you're a tech CEO of a startup with 12 people, should you be subject to the same level of scrutiny as a presidential candidate or other public figure? So I always think there are some corner cases like this that we should explore. I think there are ways that uh, the internet has um, has changed these boundaries some, and so I do think we need to re-examine some of these uh, some of these corner cases. But I think on on the core principle of uh, of uh, something like New York Times v. Sullivan, uh, that 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 obviously should stand, and that's been. That's been a good thing. I don't. I don't think that needs that needs to change or should change. Well, speaking of Charles Harder has now developed a reputation as the go-to lawyer for the rich and powerful when they want to threaten media outlets. Uh, he now represents Roger Ailes against the New York Magazine, Melania, Melania Trump against the Daily Mail, and other clients. As a libertarian, do you feel this is a threat to freedom of the press in any way? Uh, and how would you characterize what he does? You know, I'm. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna speak to all the. You know, I'm not familiar with all the details of all the litigation. I'm not underwriting any, any of those lawsuits, just to be very clear. I do, think, um, I do think what actually matters in litigation is what happens at the end game. It's sort of like the, you know, it's like the, if you want to understand litigation, it's like the Capablanca line in chess. You must begin by studying the end game. You must begin by thinking about, you know, do you actually ultimately win or lose? And that's and uh, you know, if you bring a harassing lawsuit and you lose, that also sets a precedent. And that's a precedent for greater press freedom over time. And so, uh, so I think that, uh, um, I think that uh, when one brings litigation, you have to think all the way through to the end game. And uh, I, would, you know, I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do it because number one, I think the First Amendment should be, uh, should be respected. But number two, um, uh, you know, many of these sorts of cases I wouldn't bring because I think that uh, I think you ultimately won't win. It's very different from Gawker, where, where you know, we could map out with a high level of certitude that if we had our day at port, we would win. Well, since you came to the lion's den of the National Press Club in some ways, uh, let me ask you about your concerns about the media today. Uh, what do you think of the problems uh, with the media, uh, the news media? Uh, and what do you think that means for society, and what would you do to fix them? Well, those are. Uh, you know, identifying the problems and how to fix them are, are two, you know, are two very, uh, very difficult, different kinds of questions. Um, you know, I, I always am fixated on economic questions, um, and the the economic challenge that's that's very severe is that a lot of the business models that media companies have um, are not working as well as they used to. Uh, I don't exactly know what you what you need to do to fix that, but. Uh, the, you know, I think the, the way I tell the history of, of media, newspapers, magazines, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of print media, was that these were um, incredibly robust monopoly businesses in the 1980s and 1990s. And if you worked at a newspaper, you were, it's like you were working at a utility company. You had this, you know, cushy, fairly sinecured uh, position because you were a local monopoly. And, um, and, uh, and uh, the, um, the internet inadvertently you know, sort of eroded, uh, eroded um, these uh, these business models. It gives you you actually have more power. You know, the stories you write reach more people. So the media is in some ways more powerful than ever. But it's uh, but it's um, but it's economically um, not doing as well. And I think that is uh, I think that is a big challenge. I think I think the monopolies that media enjoyed were in some ways a good thing because you know even though we don't want monopolies in many cases. They, ha they did provide a positive externality for our society. The monopolies were good. The monopolies have been eroded. And, um, and that's, that's, that's sort of the core challenge. Um, it's not the self-understanding people have. You know, you normally don't like to say, you know, I'm, I'm working at a monopoly company, and that's why we're doing so well. But I think that's the, that's the history of what happened and what needs to be understood better. Sticking with the Gawker situation for a second, on the opposite side, since you say you're a believer in freedom of the press and in, in good journalism, do you think it's a responsibility of uh, folks like yourselves who have the resources and the ability to help fund good journalism out there? And would you do so? Uh, you know, I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't. Uh, um, I wouldn't want to compete with uh, 
with uh, Jeff Bezos ever. You know, so he's the, I think he's the toughest person in the world to compete with at this point. So I, just to be very clear, you know, I have no plans to buy the Washington Times. <laughs> um, but I think that, uh, I think that, uh, I think sort of getting, uh, I think, you know, I, I think it's possible that that's, that that's a direction that, uh, that uh, media will, will change in, uh, where it becomes almost a sort of nonprofit undertaking. I'm not sure that's, I'm not sure that's the healthiest way for the media industry to develop because I think, you know, I think a lot of nonprofit organizations are not that effective. They're, they're sort of weirdly uh, distorted. They, they do good, but it's, it's, uh, it's actually, um, it's often, they're often not managed all that well. And so, um, so it, perhaps it moves in that direction, but um, I'm not sure that's the, that's the solution to the problem. Switching subjects a little bit, uh, as a libertarian, what do you think are the greatest threats to freedom today? Uh, and what do you think can help increase people's individual freedoms? Well, I think it is, uh, you know, the, the sort of, look, the ideological libertarian answer to that is always the government. And, uh, and, then, uh, and, then, and then probably, um, as a, from a civil libertarian perspective, it's, it's uh, government, um, fighting too many wars, it's government incarcerating too many people in our society, it's, uh, it's government uh, regulating the economy too much. And, and then, you know, I would, I would like to see, so I'd like to see less involvement by the U.S. In, um, in, in, um, in, in, as a global, less, less of the U.S. as a global policeman. I would like to see, uh, I would like to see fewer people in jail in the U.S. It's another place where the U.S. is an exceptionally crazy country where we have an incarceration rate that's completely out of sync with the rest of the developed world. And uh, I'd like to see, you know, if we had an incarceration rate like Western Europe or Canada or Australia, uh, that would be a, a sane direction for us to go in. Uh, and, then, uh, and then the regulation of businesses. So I think, I think uh, you know, I, I don't think, I, I think there are parts of libertarianism that always sound fringe. I think, uh, I think the way, the, the issues I would want to focus on are ones that, uh, where the U.S. actually just becomes um, um, like other developed countries. Going back to your Republic National Convention speech, you said, our nuclear bases still use floppy disks. Our new, newest fighter jets can't even fly in the rain. Uh, and it would be kind to say the government software works poorly because so much of the time it doesn't work at all. Uh, if you're talking about uh, you know, less government and uh, uh, more libertarian things, how does, it, how does America fix that stuff still? Uh, well, this is where, this is where I think I think uh, my, my, my ideal would be a smaller government that does more with less. You know, not, you know, the, look, the ideological debates we have in Washington, D.C. are always more with more versus less with less. It's sort of runaway spending with no controls or austerity where, you know, you're 300 pounds and you will chop off your thumb as a weight control measure. So it's, you know, that's, that's sort of the weird, that's the weird public policy debate we have. And, you know, what the technology industry is about, what is, is always doing more with less. And I think that would be a, that would be a healthy, uh, healthy perspective for us to have in, in DC. So the, you know, the question is, can we have, you know, whatever we, we spend on the military, can we, can we uh, achieve the same for less? Um, so if you have an F-35 uh, fighter jet that doesn't fly in the rain, um, maybe you could uh, have, is there such a thing as a less expensive jet that can fly in the rain? Uh, I suspect there is. Um, and, and so, I, and so and, and, and this, is where I, this is where I differ from libertarians because they might, uh, they might be excited about the F-35 jet and say, good, we can just shut down the whole government. And I think, you know, I think we should take it as a challenge to, to make it work better. If you can never do better than the F-35, that's a super libertarian perspective, because then you have to just shut everything down. If everything's as bad as the F-35, you should just shut down everything in this town, have everyone go home. Um, and uh, what, I, what I always point out to in these things, though, is that there's been a decline. You know, libertarianism would not have sold as well in the, in the 40s or 50s or 60s in the US. If you were a libertarian, that was, it's fringe today, it was super fringe in the 50s and 60s, because that was a society where the premise that the government couldn't do anything didn't make sense. The Libertarian Party got started in the 1970s in the US. That's when it took off. And the 1970s is the decade where, where things really stopped working in this country, and especially on the governmental side. And so I think there's this, 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 this deep link between libertarianism and, 
and uh, the decline of our, our governmental institutions. Before I ask the final question, a quick reminder, the National Press Club is the world's leading professional organization for journalists, and we fight for a free press worldwide. For more information about the club, please visit our website at press.org. That's press.org. Also, a quick reminder about some upcoming programs. On November 21, Gina McCarthy, the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, will speak here. November 30, Paul Wiedenfeld, the general manager of the Washington Metropolitan Transit Authority, will be here. And on December 2nd, we'll host MGM Resorts Chairman and CEO James Murren. Uh, I'd like to ask, again, the audience to remain seated until our guest has departed. And I'd also like to present our guests with the traditional National Press Club mug. Thank you very much. <laughs> so my final question, sir. What's your future in politics? After this race is over, how do you decide which candidates or perhaps political parties you're going to support? Well, uh, you know, I think my future is going to continue to be in the tech industry. Uh, that's what I am good at. That's what I enjoy doing. Um, I, always have a, I always have this view of a somewhat schizophrenic view of politics, where I think it's a, it's a horrible business. Uh, it's incredibly destructive. Uh, a lot of it is like trench warfare on the Western Front, where there's crazy amounts of carnage and nothing ever changes. Um, and then that's, on, that's one part of my schizophrenic view. The other part is that it's really important. There's some problems that can't be solved outside of this political arena. And uh, the way I deal with my schizophrenia is that I occasionally get involved, but don't want to make it a full-time thing. Thank you for being here, Mr. Till. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you.